sería la if no. A very pleasant uh, morning to all the attendees, esteemed faculty members and dear research scholars and students who have joined us today. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the two-day national webinar series on the theme of literature and literary studies organized by the Department of English and other foreign languages, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram Campus, Chennai. Uh, once again, we have uh, uh, two very interesting and enlightening lectures lined up today and tomorrow by very reputed and learned resource persons. I'm sure that you will all have a lot to take away from the upcoming live session, so please stay tuned. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to present the topics of the webinar series. Uh, the topic of the live session today is uh, Cultural Materialism, Revisiting Shakespeare's Othello, uh, by Dr. Anthony Sami, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, Loyola College, Chennai. Day two will feature a live broadcast on liminal space, the world of expatriates by Dr. N. Kavida, Assistant Professor of English, Alagappa Government Arts College, Karekudi. Uh, before we move on to the welcome address, I would gently remind all the attendees who have joined us today uh, to stay with us till the end of the session to access the feedback and don't forget, to, uh, don't forget to post your queries, if any, uh, in the live chat stream on YouTube during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, I would now like to call upon uh, Dr. Rama, Professor and Head, Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Walter. Uh, good morning, attendees. The Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram campus extends a warm and hearty welcome to all of you to the webinar on cultural materialism, revisiting Shakespeare's Othello. Cultural materialists, I think all of you know, deal with uh, very specific historical documents. And they also uh, try to attempt and analyze and also recreate actually the Zedgeist of that particular moment in history. So the very word cultural materialism immediately brings to mind Shakespeare for all of us. And uh, this cultural materialism actually focuses on uh, the forces, especially the ideological forces at work in Shakespeare, in Shakespeare studies. And what's interesting is even in contemporary restagings and representations of Shakespeare and his work. And uh, friends, we have with us today a seasoned academician, Dr. K. S. Anthony Sami, head, Department of English, Loyola College, Chennai. He is very popular in the literary circles, and he will be the most fitting person to throw light on this interesting topic. On behalf of the university and the department, I express my heartfelt gratitude uh, to you, sir, for your presence and participation. I thank you, sir, and I heartily welcome you. Uh, to take the session further, I call upon my colleague, Asha, for the introductory remarks. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. And this is uh, Mrs. Asha Janifur, Assistant Professor, English, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramabram, Chennai. I take this opportunity as a privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. K. S. Anthony Sami, Head Department of English, Loyola College, Chennai. He has 26 years of experience at Loyola College, Chennai. Presently, he is an associate faculty in Loyola Institute of Business Administration. He has donned several hats across academic areas as Dean of Students, Divisional Commander of NCC Navy, advisor of All India Catholic University Students Federation and secretary of Teaching Staff Association at Lila College. Currently, he also serves as an advisor to the Southern Region of Staff Selection Commission, Government of India. English language teaching is his area of research. He is a specialist in literary theory and criticism, along with English for specific purposes. He has contributed scholarly articles on various topics in many reputed journals. 
to name a few, doing research in ELG and learn, unlearn, and relearn. He has been successfully guiding PhD and MPhil scholars of various universities. He has he has organized UGC sponsored seminars and national workshops. He has completed UGC approved minor research project titled Effective Implementation of CCE. And so far, he has conducted over 300 seminars and workshops. He was invited to contribute and participate in the IAFEL International Conference held in Glasgow, United Kingdom. He presented a paper at the fourth European Conference held in Paris. In recognition of all these academic accomplishments, he was conferred with the Best Teacher Award by Grab's Educational Charitable Trust in 2017 and Best Mentor Award by Dr. Kalam Educational Trust in 2019. We are greatly honored to have such a versatile personality as our guest speaker today. I welcome you, sir. The forum is yours. Uh, yes, sir. Would you like to start your presentation, sir? Yeah, yes. Is that uh, uh, visible, Walter? Yes, Hello? sir. Yes. Yes, it is visible, sir. Okay. At the outset, uh, let me thank the faculty members, uh, especially Dr. Rama, head of the department, Professor Asha who welcomed all of us and introduced me. Uh, my dear participants, the faculty members, and the students of SRM, Ramaburma campus, and the resource person, Dr. Kavita, who is going to speak on liminal spaces, the world of expatriates, for this webinar on literature and literary studies. A warm morning to all of you. Without much ado, I just want to take you to the outline of my presentation. I'm going to divide my presentation into two parts. Part one will focus on uh, what is meant by new historicism and cultural materialism. In fact, presented as two sides of the same coin. And the connection between literature and history, a little more details about uh, new historicism and cultural materialism. The theoretical affiliation with which cultural materialism started functioning as one of the approaches to literature, understanding of literature. There are certain defining characteristics and the difference between new historicism and cultural materialism. These are the aspects that I will cover in my first part of the lecture. And in the second part, of course, I would like to discuss uh, Odalo, the play by Shakespeare, in terms of how the characteristics of cultural materialism are embedded in the play or the law and some of the directions which we have for that particular analysis is production of uh, ideology, a testimonious a defiance, a reading dissidence. And of course, I also want to refer to Prospero and Caliban to give you variety in my presentation. So these are the two parts that I will be concentrating on today during my uh, lecture. My dear participants, many of you could have heard of uh, these uh, terms, new historicism and cultural materialism. And uh, these are the approaches that are very, very popular during 1960s and 70s. And how is it still relevant in 21st century, especially after the, uh, you know, the uh, you know, advent of uh, so many other theories, cultural theories, post-colonial literary theory, and um, 
the theory is related to bisexual uh, gay lesbian and transgender uh, indigenous cultures and so on because the word culture is definitely uh, is exciting to all of us whether it has got the same meaning that we understand now or it has got a different meaning especially when it is aligned with materialism cultural materialism and that is the reason why i thought i should uh, speak on cultural materialism and as a kind of a literary approach to uh, most of the, the productions that uh, you know we had during renaissance period and that is the reason why i wanted to illustrate cultural materialism with an example of what the law cultural materialism is a term uh, coined by raymond williams and of course popularized by jonathan dolly moore and alan sinfield uh, in their collection of essays political shakespeare jonathan dolly moore and sinfield used uh, lots of references to cultural materialism it refers to a marxist orientation of new historicism you may uh, listen to my reference to new historicism and cultural materialism for the next 20 minutes because they are uh, referred to uh, uh, as two sides of the same coin it is only my uh, coinage there are no political or uh, refer- political references are there are no academic references to this particular term two sides of the same coin okay so in fact um, uh, cultural materialism uh, is a british version of what we know the uh, american version of the same thing as new historicism which i will talk to you little later cultural materialism if you think um as a kind of an approach or a theory it emphasizes studying the historical context looking at those historical aspects that have been discarded or silenced in other narratives of a history it emphasizes a kind of an eclectic theoretical approach it is backed by a political commitment arising from the influence of marxist and feminist perspectives and executes a definite textual analysis a close reading of the text that critiques traditional approaches especially on canonical text like shakespeare new historicism and cultural materialism are two literary theories that have similar characteristics as i told you the key difference between new historicism and cultural materialism is that new historicism focuses on the oppression in the society that has to be overcome in order to achieve change whereas cultural materialism focuses on how that particular change is brought about this is the key difference between new historicism and cultural materialism new historicism and cultural materialism are two sides of the same coin once again i refer to that one is the head the other is the tail both are equal if new historicism is the head concentrating on those at the top of the social hierarchy namely the church the monarchy the upper classes cultural materialist is the tail concentrating on those at the bottom of the social hierarchy namely the lower classes women and the marginalized people literature and history are inseparable genres the revival of history is an important aspect in the study of new historicism in fact in their introduction to new historicism and the renaissance drama 
Richard Wilson and Richard Dutton uh, makes an observation that literary, a new historicist and cultural materialist theories mark the return to history in literary criticism. It's a return to history. For uh, a few years, uh, the historical approach was poo food as something that has got a kind of a, an extra, you know, uh, additional, you know, information that has been generated by history, a kind of a two, you know, forces, namely literature and history, are yoked together unnaturally. But then new historicists and cultural materialists are the ones who revived the return to history in literary criticism. So that is the very important point we should keep it in mind. The focus on the status of history in literary text is probably the most important contribution which these theories have made during the recent works in literary studies. These two theories share a common preoccupation with the relationship between literature and history. What is the relationship between literature and history? That is the main objective of new historicism and cultural materialism. Of course, both differ in a very subtle manner, which I will definitely highlight during the course of my lecture. In the eyes of new historicist and cultural materialist critics, Texts of all kinds are the vehicles of politics. This is the problem with them. All texts are the vehicles of politics. They are the texts that mediate the fabric of social, political, and cultural formation. This particular view is very, very evident in the work of new historicists and cultural materialists because they read historical context through legal, medical, and panel uh, uh, documents, I mean, penal documents, anecdotes, travel writings, and ethnological and anthropological narratives, and of course, literary text also. The return to history means reading history through legal documents medical and penal documents, anecdotes, which are not recorded in the regular history. That is the difference. The regular history is written in a very linear fashion, whereas a new historicist and cultural materialist look for some of the documents that are available off the record. That's the main point. These two Schools of critics argue that literature does have powerful effects on history and vice versa. They pay a considerable attention in their work to the effects of literature in both containing and promoting subversion and the instances of state and hegemonic control over cultural expression. In other words, these two schools of critics are interested in discovering how the past cultural history promotes indirectly subversion and provide instances of the state and hegemonic control over cultural expression. There are lots of expression even today in the context of Corona, how the state and the center controls their own thought, the, the, the thought of the common people by their ideologies. They have a certain ideology and they would like to control the thought of the people. And people also automatically accept these thoughts, thinking that this is the way of the world. Okay. Now, what is new historicism? Briefly, Louis Montrose in um, Professing the Renaissance, the Poetics and the Politics of Culture. That's the name of the book. 
claims that new historicism deals with the textuality of history and the historicity of the text is a very very popular statement made by luis mantos while talking about a new historicism new historicism looks for the textuality of the history not the uh, ordinary the original i mean the, uh, the uh, history that you read as a history of india or history of europe now they look for the textuality of history the text that are available off the record the text that are even recorded in history textuality and also they are interested in the historicity of the text what is the history what is the uh, culture what is the context that has created the text that also is very important for new historicist while historicity of text refers to the cultural specificity and the social embedment of all modes of writing the rootedness of the text in the socio historical political and cultural ambience of its production textuality of history refers to the fictionality and constructedness of the history so these two phrases are very very important for us to understand new historicism in fact uh, michel foucault and others would say there is no such a thing called objective history because history is a narrative history is also a kind of a, a narration which is very subjective in nature which is done by the dominant groups dominant institutions history is where influenced by kings monarchs and emperors therefore what was neglected is much more important for the explication of the text that are produced in that particular context in that particular group new historicism is a mode of critical interpretation which privileges power relations as the most important context for all text of all kinds as a critical practice it treats literary text as a space where power relations are made visible some of the text even if you read a midsummer's night dream you may understand the kind of power relations that are in conflict between fathers and daughters between the kings and the queens the kind of power relation that are in conflict that are uh, dissident in nature are made very very visible uh, jonathan dolimore uh, gives an example from queen elizabeth uh, life in fact queen elizabeth's anxiety is much brought in for the understanding of new historicism here queen elizabeth's anxiety was that a play that implied a criticism of her namely richard the second was played 40 times in open streets and houses now dolly moore uh, points out elizabeth's anxiety as if it was a kind of an indictment on her personal life the more the play was acted out on the streets the more the anxiety was growing in queen elizabeth because queen elizabeth was implied there as one of the point of criticism and that is the reason why it was sometimes curtailed even being acted uh, staged on street richard the second and moving on to one more point about uh, the cultural uh, culture being a self regulating system in the new historicism is derived from claude levistras theory claude levistras recognition uh, or his, uh, his theory that culture is a self regulating system just like a language that a culture polices its own customs and practices in subtle and ideological ways right for new historicists the recognition has been extended to that self 
particularly in Stephen Greenblatt's early and seminal study, Renaissance Self-Fashioning. What makes the operations of power particularly complex is the fact that the self polices and regulates its own desires and repression. There may not be any control system, but still the self, one's own self, controls itself because of the ideology, that, that particular power system. It is that ideology, that power system, that becomes a point of criticism, point of reference for new historicists. This you will understand later when I illustrate with the, the play or the law. The next point, moving on to cultural materialism. What is cultural materialism then? If a new historicism is based on power politics at the higher level, cultural materialism is also based on power politics at the lower strata of the society. And a very basic level, cultural materialism is equated with the new historicism because both the practices interpret literary text as historical and cultural artifacts. Jonathan Dolimore and once again Alan Sinfield describe cultural materialism in political Shakespeare as studies in studies that implies literary text in history. In other words, we may say that it is a study of the implication of literary text in history, the implication of literary text in history. And therefore, it is a historical or historicist approach to literature. Cultural materialism is also known as historicist approach to literature. Why then there are uh, different names? That is, again, a point of reference for us to understand. Like new historicism, cultural materialism privileges power relations as the most important context for interpreting text. See, for literary critics, the point of criticism is focused on the kind of power relations and the conflict between power relations in the text, embedded in the text, especially in the place of Shakespeare or the text written during Renaissance period. What makes the difference uh, between new historicism and cultural materialism once again is, now, if new historicism focuses on the power relations of the past societies, Say, for example, 16th century society. Cultural materialists explore literary texts within the context of contemporary power relations. The cultural materialists go beyond a step and say that the power relations of the past uh, centuries, namely 16th century, is important. At the same time, the power relations of the contemporary society, even the 20th century society, is also important for understanding of the text in the past. I think that makes the difference between these two uh, you know, approaches. For example, for cultural materialist, the right-wing politics of Thatcherism, Margaret Thatcher, who uh, uh, was the prime minister of England during uh, 1980s, uh, even her politics was brought in as a context for understanding the revisited Shakespearean text, the revisited textbooks of Webster, William Wordsworth, Charles Dickens, and even post-war British literature. So that is what cultural materialism is different from new historicism. For new historicism, it is the power relations of the past, embedded in the past societies. For cultural materialism, it is a power relations embedded both in the past as well as the present society. That is the difference. Cultural materialism is, again, is uh, interested in so many uh, uh, things. Number one, according to cultural materialists, text 
always have a material function within contemporary power structure this is demonstrated by allen sinfield in fault lines another essay written by allen sinfield where he examines how the royal ordinance of an ordinance advertisement for defense equipment in 1989 utilizes shakespeare in promoting itself as a bastion for security and tradition see now shakespeare's play was used as a kind of a reference for the royal ordinance advertisement for defense that happened during 1989 so in that way i think it is definitely related to the contemporary politics now on the next point uh, canonical text and the authors are used to validate the contemporary political and cultural tradition once again it is uh, similar to what i was you know, explaining to the previous point in this context only allen sinfield says that the main effect of cultural production will generally be the reproduction of an existing order so when you produce a culture it is also a reproduction of the existing order it is not a reproducing of the past culture it is reproduction of the existing culture also now ideology works in language and our own deployment of language but more than this ideology exists in material form through institutions like the church the school the theater and the university and the museum now even if you look at you know the uh, the picture that i have added here is the globe theater where you will understand the different galleries and the people who are standing on the ground you know this itself is a kind of an ideology that speaks about the power relations that the people theater goers had and the gallery is meant for one set of people and the ground is me- is meant for one set of people now the strategic positions of the gallery are occupied by the lords and the monarchs to watch the play so that particular theater itself globe theater the shape of the globe theater itself is a kind of a culture kind of an ideology that was introduced and people started understanding this particular culture and followed automatically as a kind of a self regulating system cultural materialists are interested in definitely is a quotations worth reading by dolly moore and sinfield a play by shakespeare is related to the context of its production to the economic and political system of elizabethan and jacobian england to the particular institutions of cultural production the court patronage theater education and the church moreover the relevant history is not just that of 400 years ago for culture is made continuously and shakespeare's text is reconstructed reappraised reassigned all the time through diverse institutions in specific context what the plays signify how they signify depends on the cultural field in which they are situated so this is exactly the main argument that cultural materialists put forward which dolly moore and sinfield have summarized in this particular quotation so what is important is it is not uh, that the history or the context of the particular period in which some of the works were written is important we need to understand the uh, the history and also the culture that are even current that are contemporary in nature in order to understand the text written in 16th century it's very very interesting to note for many of you may even question how shakespeare in order to understand shakespeare the context of 20th century is important now the cultural materialist practices 
you know a certain uh, dissident uh, in a, uh, practices as a particular uh, methodology which would help us to understand uh, and also examine literary text as a part of wider context in cultural and political institution shakespeare is regarded for example in the context of his prevalence as a cultural icon manufactured as a genius and a master figure through the media of education industry theater and heritage as a business now how shakespeare is projected even today matters for as to understand the power politics that are embedded in shakespeare right that is the point now shakespeare is part of uh, uh, literature paper without uh, shakespeare uh, as a paper offered to as a paper english literature is incomplete that itself is a kind of a politics you know we the contemporary society is subscribing ascribing to uh, shakespeare's place right so that is very very important for us to understand what cultural materialism is so in order to understand the cultural materialism and the new historicism you should understand the two important terms like subversion and dissidence subversion refers to a practice by which the values and principles of a system in place that are contradicted and reversed in an attempt to transform the established social order and its structures of power authority hierarchy and social norms that means subversion is an attempt to overthrow the power the power that is oppressing the other forces that is very important for example the power of the uh, church was disrupted because of the power politics by some of the sections of the society that were affected by the church right now queen elizabeth was criticized by some sections of the society and that is what is being reflected in the plays of shakespeare so there is always a kind of a subversion a kind of a, a force that is trying to overthrow the power now in this very process of overthrowing power that force itself become a kind of an entrapped thing they 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 fall into that kind of entrapped model the very fact that you know the uh, the force that is working behind overthrowing the power should liberate their minds instead they become those forces become entrapped in the power politics and that is what happens in subversion whereas dissidence as used by alan sinfield is only showing the protest here there is no uh, kind of a conniving there is no a plot there is no plot to uh, grab the power but it is only a, a only a kind of a protest against the official policy dissidence aims at criticizing the authority the government or the powerful person or a group and that's the reason why cultural materialist want to use dissident as a strategy uh, to understand the text in other words cultural materialist look for uh, look for dissident forces whereas new historicists would look for subversive forces in the literary text you will understand this distinction once again when i illustrate what the law as an example little more about um, uh, cultural materialism since we have the time cultural materialism of course uh, kind of uh, 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 theory that was uh, popularized as i told you during 70 1970s and 1980s also 1960s 70s and 80s and uh, it has got a context in fact in england the there are two influences that shaped up cultural materialism number one uh, it was a sociology of literature conferences held at the essex university from 1976 to 19 
1884. And the one more influence was the journal brought out in the name of Literature and History, uh, founded in the year 1975. And it was edited by Thames Polytechnic. Both the conference and uh, the journal were very, very significant in developing and formulating or even fashioning a new historical approaches to literature in Britain. Okay. Now, the focus was primarily on emphasizing the importance of history, as I told you, as a shaping force of literary text. So, history is the shaping force of literary text. Therefore, if you understand the history, the unrecorded history especially, you will understand the power politics that are embedded in the literary text. So that's the main point. Now, one quotation that I have given in this particular slide here is the uh, also is very important because Dolly Moore and Sinfield explain that the breakup of uh, consensus in British political life during 1970s was accompanied by the break up of traditional assumptions about the values and the goals of literary criticism. This itself is an indication how literary texts written in the past are continuously revived and reshaped by the contemporary politics. And initially at the specialized conferences and in the committed journals, right? But increasingly in the mainstream of intellectual life, literary texts were related to the new challenging discourse of Marxism, feminism, structuralism, psychoanalysis and post-structuralism. It is widely admitted that all this has brought a new rigor and excitement to literary discussions. At the same time, it has raised profound questions about the status of literary text, both as linguistic entities and as ideological forces in our society. Now, in other words, the political turmoil that was experienced during 1970s, once again, the Conservative Party was overthrown because of, you know, the government, the, 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 the strike against the government by the gold, gold miners. And once, and this is the time the England experienced a kind of a turmoil and the, the, uh, 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 the, the think a group of people who were able to think for themselves wanted to refine you know the kind of movement that they also wanted to bring in in literature also now the theoretical affiliation quickly uh, as i told you uh, the materialist approach to uh, study of culture if you if you understand cultural materialism a kind of a materialist approach to the study of culture. Culture is one thing and material is another thing. But how these two are combined? This is the context and that is why I just wanted to refer to this particular you know, context, the theoretical affiliation. Now, culture is a word uh, uh, and it is a concept keenly interested in uh, you know, the study of art the study of uh, high culture like Shakespeare and plays and low culture like uh, a television serials or pop music and so on. How this is considered as a material. Any culture has to be, any culture is understood in terms of materialist function. This is the contribution by Marxist critics, especially by Raymond Williams. Raymond Williams, in his book, Culture and Society, he words, Marxism and literature and materialism and culture, argues that literature is not autonomous. He says, we cannot separate literature and art from other kinds of social practice in such a way as to make them subject to quite special and distinct laws. That means, you know, art, literature, uh, art or literature is embedded in social practices. Only when you understand the social practices, you will understand literature. 
just like you understand history you understand literature you understand literature you understand history something like this the kind of relationship between a society and the literature is reciprocal the kind of a reciprocal relationship raymond williams by no means alone in conducting a materialistic analysis of culture he is not the only one to do a, a study on materialistic analysis of culture it is again richard hogart who lived between 1918 to 20, 2014 the author of the uses of literacy aspects of working class uh, life 1957 he is the one who also brought in the important aspect of the culture as a means of object of literary study as literature and one more uh, writer who also brought in this particular uh, view point is thompson ep thompson he also looked at study of literature uh, from the point of view of uh, history so from the point of view of history and uh, society and also the social practices literature has to be studied so this is the contribution made by all these three important thinkers and you should take it as a kind of a theoretical affiliation to this particular uh, you know theory now in order to give you an example uh, uh, from the oliver twist oliver twist is a story about the poor people in england who got unfair treatment from the society now dickens describes the poor condition suffered by people especially children during victorian era many people poor people unlucky children during the victorian england were born and sent to the workhouses therefore the novel oliver twist becomes a kind of a criticism on the social injustice social inequality and discrimination this particular social injustice and disparity is what is being highlighted as one of the characteristics of uh, the literary text that is operant in the conditioning this is what the literary theorists are interested in discovering right and the one more example if you want we can give it uh, from jnair's uh, uh, mad woman in the attic reference you re- you remember bertha uh, mason edward rochester's uh, clantenstein uh, wife the first wife uh, kept in a secret was an essential component of the plot of jane eyre and the character development in the life of rochester also rochester discloses the identity of the woman locked in the attic of his thornfield uh, hall as his wife after a thwarted attempt to marry jane eyre uh, okay now this example could be understood as a kind of a dissident strategy opposing strategy that is operant operating within the society within that family condition that is what cultural materialists are interested in okay and i'm sure you know this particular uh, incident has become inspiration to virginia wolf to write you know uh, uh, critical essay uh, you know the rooms of one soul on again and again the, there were titles the mad woman in the attic by feminist critics all these you know have a reference to the contemporary you know cultural politics so one more important theoretical affiliation if you understand is uh, uh, cul- the structures of feelings cultural materialism takes a good deal of its uh, outlook from the british left wing critic raymond williams right now raymond williams uh, notion of structures of feeling similar to what michel foucault no uh, says about a discourse in his book discourse and um, uh, structures of feelings are concerned with the meanings and the values as they are lived and felt now some of the literary texts record the feelings different layers of feelings as lived by the common people 
and cultural materialists are interested in discovering these different layers of feelings as recorded as lived by the common people and that is what is interesting to cultural materialism okay now one more thing uh, louis althusser's word interpolation again is something that new uh, cultural materialists are interested in althusser's interpolation as used in ideology and ideological state apparatus uh, means it is hailing it is a calling out then the meaning is hailing or calling out interpolation refers to a kind of branding people as a kind of a referent right individuals are interpolated individuals are given an identity from the day they are born perhaps even before since parents and others conceive of that role and identity that their child will assume now i i can i you know i can give you an example of how people are categorized with a different uh, you know names in a society uh, i can't openly say you know some of the caste names they are branded as if they are only meant for this particular work in the society and the children inherit that particular identity so this is what we uh, althusser means by the word interpolation so it is that interpolation is also is interesting to cultural materialism uh, 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 cultural materialism as i told you is a politicized form of historiography this is according to graham holderness another definition cultural materialism is a kind of a politicized form of historiography historiography itself is a study of history study of history it's a polit politicized form it is a study of historical material right within a politicized framework in other words even though the term was coined by raymond williams jonathan dolimore and alan sinfield have come out with the defining characteristics of cultural materialism number 1 historical context the cultural materialism has four characteristics number 1 historical context what was happening at the time the text was written historical context undermines the transcendent significance traditionally accorded to the literary text and the aim of this aspect of cultural materialism is to allow the literary text to re recover its histories which previous kinds of study have often been ignored they say that emphasis on historical context suggests that timeless value cannot be accorded to canonical text so that particular historical context is very important next what is the theoretical method on which cultural materialism has been built cultural materialism incorporates older methods of theory namely structuralism post structuralism etc and it is absorbs lessons from them and breaks away from liberal humanism that was popular during early 20th century you know liberal humanism focused on the nature of man and the defects on the society that's all the main focus was the study of man right for in, in any literature the critics would look for the nature of man uh, even as uh, dr johnson uh, would say the shakespeare was a great poet because he was a poet of nature he says he was a poet of human nature so uh, hum uh, uh, liberal humanism was focusing on the discovery of the human nature that is embedded in literary text it is only the cultural materialist and new historicist they started looking for something else that is how the culture how the historical context that shape up the literary text then political commitment cultural materialism incorporates non conservative non christian frameworks such as feminist and marxist theory 
the influence of marxist and feminist perspectives are accepted and the break from uh, conservative christian framework is initiated the first time the influence from the conservative christian framework was cut off and the the the, the, the literary theories were rooted in some of the principles of feminism and the marxist theory the next textual analysis now if you think that uh, new uh, cultural materialism is interested only in historical context or a theoretical background other than humanism or it has got a political commitment based on feminist and marxist theory what about the text will they uh, ignore text no they are cultural materialists are interested in critic critiquing a kind of uh, you know, analyzing the some of the expressions used in the text right the some of the words that are interest that, that that have that are embedded in the cultural aspect are also very very important therefore cultural materialists are interested in textual analysis of the uh, analysis also and once again cult here are some of the characteristics are only uh, the repetition of what i have already said therefore we move on to the next one is Uh, the difference between uh, new historicism and cultural materialism uh, quickly the difference as i told you is new historicists to uh, tend to concentrate on those at the top of the social history whereas cultural materialists uh, concentrate on those at the bottom of the social history cultural uh, new historicists focuses on uh, oppressive aspects of the society that people have to overcome to achieve the change and cultural materialist focus on how that change is brought about the third one a cultural uh, materialist use quote text from the entire trajectory of uh, the text history you see uh, the quote text what we call uh, the historical documents that are not recorded uh, in the regular history they are called quote text So for new historicist and cultural materialist it is not only the text that matters for the analysis or the understanding but it is the core text that uh, that you know we refer to as some of the anecdotes some of the records that are available uh, unrecorded uh, uh, information available they are called the core text both are very very important and these texts are taken into consideration up to the contemporary time present time whereas new historicists would use only the core text of that particular past that particular context so this is again the another important you know difference new historicism of course was influenced by the philosophy of michel foucault who talk about a discursive practices and uh, cultural materialism talks about is based on the structures of feeling that becomes a backbone of uh, you know their peer practice now uh, i now having said about uh, new historicism and cultural materialism i know i may need some 10 more minutes for uh, to illustrate this particular point kindly bear with me i am moving on to the second part of my uh, lecture how what the law is read in the light of cultural materialist approach now um, i i actually wanted to narrate the story of uh, othello and um, for the sake of some other participants may not who may not have read for want of time i'll just skip that story assuming that many of you would be able to follow the story but then the story uh, in a very nutshell is given in this particular slide iago is very very furious about being overlooked for promotion and therefore plots to take revenge against his general othello the moor of venice iago therefore manipulates othello into believing that his wife desdemona is unfaithful stirring othello's jealousy othello allows jealousy to consume him murders desdemona and then finally kills himself here what is important is what the law being black the moor of venice is married to the venetian woman 
Desdemona. See, that is the difference that you should note down here in the story. That is how culture, the power politics operated behind this particular uh, plotting by Iago and the killing of Vardalo, killing of Desdemona by Vardalo. So this is what you should, you know, understand. I just want to use the essay Cultural Materialism, Vardalo and the Power of Plausibility written by Alan Sinfield. Most of the remarks are taken from this particular essay written by Alan Sinfield in 1992. It is stated in the story for the law that Iago's discourse, Iago's story, what was his story? Destamona is unfaithful. Now, what the law being black is not suitable to Destamona. These kinds of discourses, this kind of story, right, works very well, not because Iago is very, very cunning, but because his lies perfectly reflect the presumptions and assumptions and prejudices of a Venetian culture that sees blacks as exotic, inferior to whites, ignorant, barbaric and prone to revert to type. See that, that is the point. Now, it is not the villainy of Iago that works in Vardalo towards the murder of Desdemona by Vardalo. It is the culture, Venetian culture that believes that the Moor, the black, is an inferior person, is an ignorant person, he is barbaric in nature. It is that belief that led to murder of uh, Destamona by Vardalo. That is what uh, Alan Sinfield argues in his essay. And this is one of the examples for cultural materialist analysis of the text. And if you even understand uh, another essay written by Ania Lumba, uh, who uh, another post-cultural, post-colonial uh, uh, literary critic, uh, critic says that what the law moves from being a colonized subject existing on the terms of the Venetian society and trying to internalize its ideology towards being marginalized, outcast and alienated from it in every way until he occupies his position as the other. Now, Anya Lumba uh, says that uh, what the law himself accepts uh, that he is a kind of a colonized subject. Even though he tries to internalize the Venetian culture and society, he is not able to internalize that ideology. That is his failure. His own incapacity, his own his incapacity to internalize the Venetian ideology is what makes him remain as a colonized subject, even though he tries to move away from being a colonized subject to you know, the colonizing or colonizer. Okay. And here, if you refer to uh, Althusser's word interpolation, now what the law is inter Interpolated. interpolated or interpolated because he is given an identity by the state of Venice as a savage and he eventually answers its pitiful or powerful call. That is a problem. Iago's strategies work not because of his cunningness but because his lies are very very plausible sensible to the Venetians and even to Adullah himself. That is a problem. Many Venetians, including uh, Cascio, Brabantio, Rodrigo, they all believe that uh, Adullah is a barbaric person. Adullah cannot live up to the expectation of the Venetian culture because 
you know, they brand him as a black, as an inferior person. Moreover, Iago's strategies work because everybody believes, because they, they are all born and brought up in that particular culture. Right. What good can come out of uh, Nazareth? That is that, that's a statement you may understand better. Now, nothing can come out of Nazareth. That is an understanding they had in the past. Similarly, you know, they uh, uh, branded for the law and finally led to his, you know, death. Now, Sinfield again says that, therefore, um, the people who are protesting, people who want to empower themselves should be able to produce ideology, potent ideology. It is the production of that potent ideology that powerful people live happily. The people at the uh, top of the ladder of the uh, strata of the society live happily. They oppress the people at the lower strata of the society. Therefore, in order to pro in order to survive, in order to empower themselves, people at the lower strata of the society should be able to produce potent ideology. The ideology that produces the greatest degree of plausibility. Plausibility here is believable. The, the, the ideology that makes people understand and accept. Okay. Not only do societies need to produce food, energy, and goods to trade, they also need to produce understandings of the system of a social relationship that keep the whole process producing everything from pork bellies to political system. Now, even during the corona, many, all of us are made to understand a particular system of social distancing. Now, it is that particular system that is produced by the government. That ideology, potent ideology has been produced by the strong, the, the mighty, the, power, the powerful. Right. Now, similarly, people at the lower strata of the society also should be able to produce such potent ideologies so that they also become powerful. It is that point of reference cultural materialists should be, cultural materialists are interested in. Stories of marginalized people sound very suspicious. Nobody believed over the law. Because that is not plausible enough. Whereas stories of Iago was plausible enough, therefore everybody believed. And that is why the tragedy, in short. Therefore, Sinfold suggests that Vattalo kills himself not because he cannot reconcile his barbaric nature by Venetian standard with an ideal of the civilized man Venice could operate with. Remember, Vaddala himself tragically believes the prevailing ideology of the Venetian state that he serves like a magnificent slave. Even though he is a general, he has got a belief that he is only a slave. He is only a moor. It is that belief only, you know, that makes him a culprit. The huh? play called you know, Now, Desdemona's defiance. Sinfield again considers the entrapment model, as Desdemona answers her father, when he attempts to exert a hegemony, a power as a dominating parent and intimidating member of the city power elite. Okay, this is the context. Now, Brabantio, um, while uh, um, being married to uh, Odello, questions, questions uh, Desdemona. Prabhanshu at the time of marriage questions, uh, Destamona. Do you perceive in all this noble company where most you owe obedience? See the language. This is where you know the textual analysis is very important. The, 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 the noble company itself is intimidation. Do you perceive in all this noble company there is a kind of an intimidation that is involved in this language? And where you most owe your obedience, that means as a woman, you have to be obedient to your father. You know, that's some, you know, that, you know, that kind of uh, oppression that is also involved here. 
no one instance where the kind of intimidation and also oppression that are indicated but very cleverly destemona answers using the dissident strategy putting back the same coin playing you know pay back the same coin say so she says that my lord my noble father i do perceive here as a i am here a divided duty i understand that there is a divided duty for me to you i am bound for life and education my life and education both do learn me how to respect you all that is fine you are the lord of my duty i am hither to your daughter but here is my husband and so much my duty as my mother showed to you preferring you before her father so much i challenge that i may profess due to the more my lord in other words as much as as much as my mother respects you as uh, her husband i respect my uh, husband the moor okay it is that particular statement you know that becomes a kind of a dissident a kind of an opposition power that is being gained by destemona right she cleverly uses the conflict that is embedded in the society in which she is brought up she also knows how much um, destemona's mother was to brabantio as you know wife and uh, husband similarly she says she claims that she was her allegiance to her husband just as her own mother was her allegiance to her husband brabant okay that is destemona's father next we want her to then dissidents what is meant by dissidents dissidents is a strategy that is used by some of the people to uh, indicate that they also want to empower themselves and there are lots of examples you can quote but then here the uh, queer theater and uh, uh, lgbt uh, groups you know their theories you know they are all uh, signs of dissident strategies in order to gain power you don't have to uh, you don't have to uh, uh, overthrow the people you have to only change the strategy in order to po- gain power you don't have to oppress anybody you don't have to uh, you know punish anybody you have to only change the strategy that will give you power that is what you know allen sinfield says uh, for the question how best dissident strategies might be developed he says no strategy emerges as a magical power the task is not to specify the one a true strategy but to be flexible and cunning as dominant ideologies are okay. sorry i am a little hurrying and uh, the last one would be uh, an example from tempest uh, referring to shakespeare's the tempest green blot says once again if it is the task of cultural criticism to decipher the power of prospero it is also the task of cultural materialist to hear the pronouncement of caliban in other words the job of a cultural materialist is to notice the contradictory elements dissidents that is what we mean by you know the, um, the contradictory elements the opposing elements uh, are available in the text it is that particular conflict that mat- becomes the subject matter of discussion for cultural materialist yeah to give you the example of um, uh, how the power is embedded in tempest and how the uh, dissidents the conflict is embedded in the conversation of caliban if you read you will understand prospero's power is expressed in his uh, dialogue in tempest act 3 and in 3 this is most clearly exemplified at the start of the play itself but then more evident in the third act he uses uh, his power of course from the help of ariel to conjure the tempest itself his magic knowledge beloved books give him the capacity to direct the action of others he says my high charms work and these mine enemies are all knit up 
their distractions they are now in my power so it is that power that is being questioned by caliban it is that power that becomes a matter of discussion for cultural materialist and new historians right how that power is being operated by people who are the helm of affairs now again coming to the example pronouncement of caliban as a dissident strategy as an opposing or conflicting force he says this island is mine by sekrox my mother which thou hast taken from me see the dissident strategy that is being available in the text right and then he says at the another place in the same uh, you know act in uh, the same one you taught me the language and my profit on it is i know how to curse i think that is what is being done by most of the post colonial writers around they are right trying to right back strike back to the center that taught uh, these colonialist work uh, the language namely english so caliban's uh, caliban's anger here at the notion that he has been taught a civilized uh, tongue a language but he will use it only to insult or demean prospero and miranda so it is actually a kind of an irony that he is you know the he cursing the master himself okay because of the power that was you know uh, forced on him unnaturally or artificially that is the point that you should uh, understand so my dear friends as we have uh, uh, discussed what cultural materialism is and how the play what the law could be read from cultural materialist point of view there are many plays there are many works written during renaissance and even during victorian england like charles dickens uh, novels could definitely be understood from the point of view of cultural materialism the main point the focus is how the power ideology the dominant power ideology is embedded in literary text and how dissident strategies that are also uh, embedded in the same literary text that are juxtaposed in canonical literature especially and that become the matter of discussion for many criticism so that's uh, something very interesting now here is a list of references that i have used and you may have a look at it uh peter barry beginning theory is a kind of an introduction introductory uh essay if you want to understand and then if you want to understand uh, new criticism uh, sorry new uh, criticism and uh, cultural materialism you may you should read brad uh, brannick brannick and john brannick and new, new criticism and cultural materialism today that is a very ex- exhaustive book and from that book only i have taken most of the my references and uh, there are other uh, essays written by dolly moore jonathan dolly moore sin field uh, political shakespeare new essays in cultural materialism etc this is the list and you may benefit from thank you for listening to me i think i have taken almost one hour little more than one hour and i am ready now to have one or two questions over to the organizers Thank you so much, sir. Welcome. Uh, sir, uh, shall we move on to a short uh, question and answer session, sir? Yes, yes, yeah, sure. So I will just uh, um, I will just tell you a couple of questions which were posted earlier in the in the live chat stream. Okay. Uh, how would you elaborate on uh, socio cultural ph- phenomena? being explained by cultural materialism how would you relate uh, between socio cultural phenomena uh, how how is it uh, 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 explained by uh, cultural materialism or what is the relationship uh socio cultural phenomena uh see as i said uh, um, you know the uh, raymond williams and uh, thompson and hogart all these three critics very clearly stated that it is the cultural practices the social practices and the history 
uh, historical context that are embedded in the text that are subject for cultural materialist analysis of a text okay now for example if uh, you take the uh, the example of even othello it is a cultural uh, context that was uh, embedded in othello for example othello was considered as a moor othello was considered as a barbaric it is the culture venetian culture now that led to the the tragedy of destemona and othello so it is that particular culture that cultural materialist are interested in discovering right so any text i would say is embedded in the historical context right now thank you sir yeah uh, shall we take the next question yes. sir yeah sure, sure. Uh, the next question is uh, on uh, uh, how would uh, social systems be better explained through cultural materialism uh, social systems social systems very good now i i quoted the example of oliver twist now the social system uh, was the pra in pra the social system in practice was the children of poor people are are were alone sent to the workhouses uh, the others were not sent that is a social system especially the orphans who were exploited you know it is that particular social system that is the matter of discussion for cultural materialist thank you sir i will make the next question appear on your screen sir yes i'm just going from the last to the to the initial one okay there is a popular belief that the shakespeare promoted colonizing the world and erasing the native cultures including language and religion of the colonies through his writings do you agree why <laughs> definitely you know much may be set on both side uh, uh, this is uh, something that is that is the reason why i wanted to give you the example of prospero uh, and uh, caliban right it is act very clear that uh, prospero indicates that it is the white man's burden to civilize the people who were found on the island namely caliban you may clearly see the correlation between the west and the east prospero being the west and the east being uh, caliban now they felt it was their uh, job white man's burden to civilize so there is definitely not only a tempest even many other place uh, shakespeare uh, could have uh, portrayed the colonizing tendency of uh, the west towards uh, the east definitely and uh, it is that matter of uh, interest is what post colonial uh, critics are interested in and that is why we have now right now revisiting shakespeare shakespeare is still point of discussion not only from the point of your politics as shakespeare being a great writer a kind of a canonical writer without uh, shakespeare no english literature paper would be complete no no syllabus would be complete all that is fine but the other uh, point of view is how he had portrayed the cultural conflict you know the the, the, the tendency to colonize uh, uh, the others was also important a discussion definitely there is uh, tendency in thank you sir yes next question is what is the relationship between new historicism and marxism with respect to this context as explained by you i would be glad to have received this answer from you very good the the relationship between new historicism and marxism uh uh it may, may not be a you know, kind of a direct one see that is why new historicism is uh, uh, based on the kind of uh, philosophy which michel foucault and few other uh, critics would advocate what they call you know discursive practices subversion the subversive practices 
whereas marxism looks at the same discursive practices from the point of view of the marginalized namely women who are marginalized namely the poor people like caliban poor people like you know vardallo right you know poor in the sense in the uh, even though vardallo is a kind of a general he is treated as a slave he is assumed as a slave he himself is made to believe that he is a slave so from the point of view of the marginalized from the point of view of the oppressed if you look at uh, you know the the, the the politics that is being involved uh, and the power that is being promoted or embedded in literary text that becomes marxist approach to uh, literary criticism and that is what cultural materialists are interested whereas new historicists are always looking at the power politics among the monarchs between monarchs and the church between the the, the producers and the actors you know uh, people at the higher start of the society only they were interested in thank you sir the next question yeah. is do you think it is possible for culturally bound characters or people to come out of the entrapment or traditional belief and false representations uh, false representations in in or from history uh definitely it is a challenging uh, one it's a very very interesting question uh, whether i think it this way or not whether it is possible or not that is again it's very important entrapment model is the very fact that i want to uh, give a new model uh, because i am not happy with the older or existing model i become uh, entrapped in this model i would i want to give you an example of french revolution and the uh, in, uh, the uh, power gained by napoleon in fact french revolution started as a kind of a movement against uh, monarchic rule in france the kingship right aristocracy now immediately that is that is like exactly what uh, you know they aimed at they aimed at liberty uh, fraternity and freedom um, and so on right and they they could have achieved it but what happens at the end of the french revolution was even though it was a very painful uh, exercise it was napoleon who was uh, um, uh, uh, who was uh, brought as a an emperor so this is the contradiction now the entrapment model people who wanted to overthrow the power power you know become an a victim become an in, Uh, become entrapped in the same model where they want they 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 wanted to you know dis uh, overthrow so that is where i think it is very very difficult for anybody to completely liberate themselves from that entrapment model it is not that easy even in some of the films you could have seen people who wanted to give a good government uh, form a government and finally they become corrupt because they have to run the government this is what exactly happens once they get into the system they understand right after all what was going on in the past was right only that particular way one can survive so that is what happens so it's very very difficult but um, it depends on the characters you know who are portrayed in the literature thank you sir sir we have uh, time for one final question Uh, yes. would you think yeah, yeah. that uh, would you say that uh, untouchables by rabindranath tagore is Uh, example of cultural materialism was a question asked by a participant um untouchables um, may, 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 may not be because sometimes uh, uh, the portrayal of the life of untouchables even mulkraj anand's untouchable uh, is a kind of a portrait right even their own uh, uh, struggle could be considered as a dissident strategy it is a dissident strategy once if you find that as a dissident strategy even now there are women writers in india who are portraying women characters who want to liberate themselves from the clutches of the uh, patriarchy or male dominated society that is an another example of dissident strategy once there is a dissident strategy that becomes a matter of cultural materialist analysis of the text yes 
Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the uh, the Q and A session. Uh, Rama, ma'am, your kind comments, ma'am. Yes, uh, uh, sir. I think uh, while you revisited Othello, you made every one of us revisit our uh, uh, literature classes of the past in our uh, college days. Uh, we are extremely thankful to you, sir. The, though the literary theories like new historicism and uh, this uh, material, though they were all, uh, you know, uh, cultural materialism, were very profound because of the examples you gave us. I think you made it uh, sound so simple, and uh, your uh, question and answer sessions were so exhaustive. I think uh, you have explained uh, to the satisfaction of every single person who answered. And uh, the examples you gave of, uh, I think, uh, Caliban and also of uh, Othello himself, I think it's uh, in a way indirectly leading us to tomorrow's uh, topic of the marginalized, uh, the liminal space, uh, marginalized. So I think I should uh, thank you immensely on behalf of the Department of English and other foreign languages and on behalf of SRM uh, for giving us all your time and explaining everything in great detail. Sir. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you once again. Welcome, and I think uh, Maithili, Maithili can take over for the formal lot of thanks. Yes, Maithili, ma'am, uh, kindly take over. Unmute yourself. Unmute. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, yes. ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we have come to the end of the session. And of course, it's a well-spent day. And I take a few minutes to thank everyone who has helped to make this event a grand success. Good things are wrought by prayer. And I thank God Almighty for showering his grace on us and brightening our days and lives. On behalf of the management and the Department of English and other foreign languages, I express my profound gratitude to our speaker, Dr. Anthony Swati, for his compelling lecture on Shakespeare's Othello. It is indeed a pleasure to listen to you, sir. I would like to thank the management for offering space and support to all our academic activities. And my heartfelt thanks goes out to our professor and head, Dr. Rema, for her constant guidance and motivation. And I thank Dr. Walter, Assistant Professor of French, for his readiness to provide technical support to all the webinars. And I would like to thank my colleague, Mrs. Asha, for her exceptional support and dedication for the success of this event. Before I end, I actually have to thank the participative audience. You are awesome. And thank you so much for your patience and your cooperation. Thank you all. I guess you all might have enjoyed the lecture as much as I did. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. With that, we come to the end of the, the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Walter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so Thank much. You. It was uh, it was you, really Rama. so enriching. It was so enriching. What, what uh, so it, uh, I, because I felt uh, the time also was, uh, you know, yes. kind of a pressure for me. And yes, it's yes. little heavy also, the <laughs> subject. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. OK. Anyway, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. You, sir. Thank even uh, uh, my teacher used to say that out of one hour talk, even five minutes information might be useful to someone. Never mind, you still go on. So I think that is the technique we should also use. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thank you, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, ma'am, for uh, inviting. Thank you, Thank you so you. much, sir, for accepting our invitation. Thank you, sir. No, no. OK. Maithili, ma'am, for coordinating the event also. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. And above all, uh, uh, Dr. Walter, who has done a very good job of hosting it without <laughs> any technical issues. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Thank We ended okay. early. Thank we ended with time. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Thank okay. you. Okay, Walter. You can go ahead and leave the studio, ma'am. Yeah. Sir, uh, you can also. Uh, I'll leave you, Avenue. Okay, sir. Ma'am, shall we uh, uh, leave the studio? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, we will share the. Shall I share? Yes, the feedback is uh, shared and submitted by most. Yeah, okay, sir.
shall we leave the yes yes ma'am you can go ahead and leave the studio okay, okay.